Well, good afternoon, Doug. It is so awesome to have you here today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I have been a fan of yours for quite a few years and to have actually been able to get you on my show, Michelle's Conversations That Matter, is um, truly, uh, I am so honored that you said yes. So thank you so much for making the time today. Well, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to work with people who care about conversations that matter. And you certainly do. And you have great instincts in this space. So I'm excited to talk about it with you. Awesome. So I first stumbled across you when I was back working my corporate job at Johnson & Johnson. I was invited to a diversity event in New York City and heard you speak. And ever since then, I've been following your work. Um, your leadership journey has been very inspiring to me. And your message that particular day that I will never... I don't think I'll ever be able to forget was really around the importance of trust and cultivating trust. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think it was a certain moment in my career where I was really becoming more aware of the value of trust, whether it was as a people leader or just as building trust within my network. Um, so I've been following you, learning from you. I admire that piece about you. And so when we had our initial conversation, I said to myself, you know, what, what is it that we could add value for people out there and have this conversation be about? And we landed on leadership and fulfillment. Um, and especially now, because I think there's a lot of people who are restless in the world who maybe are in jobs and starting to really look to see what is the fulfillment piece that they long for they may not have. So it's just going to be a really great conversation. I'm so excited to have it with you. Um, but just before, for Pope, for people who do not know me and they do not know what this is and what I do, I just want to share. So this is Michelle's Conversations That Matter. I'm out to elevate the conversation around emotional well-being, mental health, but also talk about those valuable topics that make that people are looking for, like conversations around leadership and fulfillment and other important topics. So um, that's just a little bit about the show, what I do every day is I get to work with people to bolster resilience, uh, whether it's through my workshops in the workplace or one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm really out to have people be empowered around their health and well-being um, and preserve mental health. So that's just a little bit about what I do. Uh, before we dive in, I'd love for you to share with us, Doug, a little bit about have my audience know who you are, where you live, what you do for a living. Um, and then we'll dive into a little bit about your journey as a leader. Okay. First of all, uh, sign me up, Michelle. I need, I need some resilience too. We'll probably get into that. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Doug Conant. I am the founder uh, of Conant Leadership headquartered in Philadelphia. The bulk of my career I was spent, spent in the corporate sector where I was president of the Nabisco Foods Company. Uh, for many years, and then CEO of the Campbell Soup Company for a decade, and then chairman of Avon Products in New York City. I'm also deeply involved in the nonprofit community as chair of the chief executives for corporate purpose in New York and the Higher Ambition Leadership Alliance in Boston. I also am involved with uh, uh, an organization that I really want to connect Michelle with, which is the National Organization on Disabilities headquartered in New York. So uh, uh, when she asked me to be on this, I felt honored. Uh, I'm originally from the Midwest. I grew up in Chicago. I moved out east, worked for Nabisco and Campbell. I still have a presence on the East Coast. I've also relocated back to the Midwest. And at this stage in my life, I just turned 71. It's amazing how active I am. Uh, I'm, I view myself as a citizen of this country, and I seem to cover it uh, east to west, north to south. And uh, I'm now, as part of Conant Leadership, I'm, at, I'm champion what we call leadership that works in the 21st century. And it's been a terrific journey. Uh, people need help leading in an enlightened way in a challenging time. I have points of view and I actively share them. And really, at the, I believe there are three key things, and we'll get into much more in just a minute, but I think it starts in my own personal leadership model, 
it starts with honoring people, inspiring trust, and really making sure that all your work is tethered to a higher ambition for yourself that really is worthy of your time on this planet. And you put those three things together and you will have a fulfilling work experience and you will be resilient. On that note, I get to turn it back over to our fearless leader, Michelle. And I, I hope I can handle the question. You're supposed to be nice to me now, Michelle. So don't make it too hard. I won't. I won't. Oh, my goodness. What a remarkable career. I want to talk a little bit about your leadership story. You kind of just you know, went real quickly over the, the companies that you led. Um, tell us a little bit more about those companies and what stands out for you as leading them um, throughout your career. Well, uh, I'm old, so some of this story may not be well known to uh, folks, but I was recruited into Nabisco right after a, a something that was chronicled uh, as Barbarians at the Gate. There was actually a movie written for it and a book written about it where uh, Nabisco, RJR Nabisco, became the world's largest leveraged buyout by KKR back in the late 1980s. Uh, and many of the executives left when it was bought out by private equity, and they were recruiting new people to come in and, and give it new life. And so I went in uh, right with the new management team, basically, and we were there for 10 years and had had a really good run. We took it from a, a very challenged company to, uh, to uh, a successful food company. And the last five years I was there, uh, the Nabisco Foods that I ran was the best performing food company in the United States. I was then recruited into Campbell to be CEO of Campbell Soup Company, two and a half hours south of where I was working. And you know, New Jersey, I was commuting down there every day from Madison, New Jersey. And uh, I was in the car four to five hours a day. I actually got a lot of work done. It was pretty good for an introvert mm -hmm. to be able to sit in the car and recover after the day and get ready to uh, engage in the day when I got in. Uh, and we may end up touching on that because I do think we have to develop personal practices that help us navigate our days in a way so that our cup is full. Yeah. Because we can, as, as you and I've talked, we cannot pour from an empty cup. So I went to Campbell. Campbell, I thought I'd seen everything when I was in the barbarians at the gate phase of my career. Mm -hmm. Campbell was more challenging. Everything that could go, go wrong had gone wrong. We were the poorest performing food company in the world of the top 20. Uh, uh, we had lost half our market value in about a year and a half. Uh, they'd had layoff after layoff. We were headquartered in the poorest, most dangerous city in the United States, Camden, New Jersey. 75,000 people, 70 murders a year. Uh, it was really challenging. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought I was up for it, and it turned out I was, but believe me, it was a test. And uh, so we we embarked on a change process there that was really built, in hindsight, around the language I use today, which is about being tough-minded on standards of performance and tender-hearted with people. And uh, uh, it's just, I just don't believe you can ask people that you work with to care about your agenda as an enterprise if they don't truly believe, truly believe that you care about their agenda as people, yeah. it just won't work. Right. So for all 10 years I was there, I was leaning in to caring and committed to building a better world for the people that worked for us, the people that worked with us and the society we served. So uh, mm. uh, that was my journey. We went from being the having the lowest employee engagement in the Fortune 500 at the end of the decade, we had the very best in the Fortune 500, unprecedented. Uh, and of our top 350 leaders, uh, we went from having the worst in the Fortune 500. And I'm going to give you a number now. Uh, it was uh, for every two people engaged in the work, one person was not. So if you had 300 people, 100 of your top 300 were not engaged and were probably looking for other jobs. Yeah. That's where we started. Wow. Where we ended up uh, was we had uh, for every one person who was not engaged, we had 77 people who were. 
Gallup had never seen scores that high. 77 to 1 was unprecedented for that large a sample size. So uh, that was uh, the story on employee engagement. And along the way, we built the business. We delivered some record cash flow, return on invested capital, and we set the table for better days ahead. So right. that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I got to ask a question. How yeah. did you elevate the engagement like that? Well, you know, it's not like one day you're highly engaged. Uh, Stephen Covey had a great line. I, I was privileged to know him and work with him, and he really helped me. You know, they say when the, uh, the, the student is ready, the teacher appears. Yeah. Stephen Covey showed up in my life at a time when I really needed to step back and reflect and get my bearings. Uh, I was in the throes of trying to contribute at, at Nabisco, and it was hard. Yeah. And and he had this line. He said, Doug, you can't talk the way talk your way out of something you behaved your way into. You have to behave your way out of it. And Campbell had behaved its way into this incredibly transactional culture, which was incredibly low trust. And my observation was from day one that nothing they don't believe a word I'm saying. They don't trust me. Right. And so I had to just put one foot in front of the other, tell them what I was going to do, do it, tell them I did it, show them that I meant business. And in the fullness of time, I had to behave my way to a place where they said, well, if where they in, believed that if, if myself or our management team said something, we were being open and honest and transparent and truthful. Right. And they could trust us. Right. Uh, you know, you and I talked briefly before, but my good friend, Stephen M. R. Covey, Stephen Covey's son, mm -hmm. he wrote the best book on trust ever with the best subtitle ever. And he said, trust is the one thing that changes everything. And uh, in my case, that's true. You build trust, you honor people, you build trust, and it feels like you can do almost anything. Right. If you don't honor people and you don't build trust, you can't even agree on when are we going to meet, right. much less how are we going to get anything done. So I, 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 I'm I, a big believer in honoring people, inspiring trust, and connecting that, as I said earlier, to this higher ambition. And, and uh, our ambition at Campbell when I was there was to nourish people's lives everywhere, every day. Everyone had a nourishing story about Campbell Soup or some of our other brands, they had all, they all remembered on that snowy winter day going home and having a grilled cheese and a tomato soup. Yes. <laughs> and, and the folks that work at Campbell want to nourish people's lives. That's why they choose to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started nourishing people's lives with our food, with our services, with our philanthropy. And, uh, and we started nourishing our world and, uh, Along the way, as we were leaning into that proposition, guess what? We were nourishing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we actually found fulfillment. Right. Is what we're talking about. Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. I want to acknowledge Leanne is here. She's uh, she's joining us from Canada, and she has some comments she wanted to make. So thanks for being here, Leanne. And anyone else who joins us, we'd love to hear your comments and questions. So please don't hesitate to drop your comments in the comments box from whatever uh, platform you're watching us today. Um, okay, so let's dive into this conversation around fulfillment. Um, you and I both coach people, and we're realizing the people that we're coaching, uh, many of them are not fulfilled. Um, I've actually had people tell me they believe it's not possible to have success and fulfillment. It's either or, either you get the money or you get the job you like, but you're not ever going to be able to find both. What do you say to those people, those executives that you are actually privileged to work with who are not fulfilled in jobs, regardless of that level of success? And they're getting present, whether it's because of COVID or other reasons, they're getting present to the fact that they desire this fulfillment they're not having. What do you say? Hey, look, if this was easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation. This is incredibly difficult because we're all scripted as we, the way we grew up, our values uh, were scripted from the very beginning by the life we've led. 
Uh, and then we have our own aspirations and trying to navigate all this in, in uh, what my one of my mentors, Warren Bennis, said, called it a, uh, co a, uh, uh, a, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, well, it'll come back to me. Uh, a such a chaotic world. It's hard. This is really a heavy lift. So I get it. And I had my own challenges this year. I, you know, this is what I do. I was supposed to be the rock of my universe. People came to me. My family came to me. I'm the oldest son. I, uh, you know, I was supposed to be the rock. And uh, I found myself just withering away and not feeling fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I wasn't taking care of myself. I was trying to take care of everybody else and it was wearing me out. And as I, as I got into this, I, I realized this is a heavy lift. But where I asked myself, well, where do I derive joy? And, and when I figured out what was joyful to me, and I'll share that with you in a minute, which was helping others. That's where I derived joy, was helping others. I found, you know, if I lean into helping others, uh, I will be more joyful. Yeah. Now, I have to do it in a way that honors my needs. So I have to take care of myself, too. But uh, I had to reevaluate what mattered most to me, which was helping others. And the more I was able to be helpful at points when they really needed it in coaching, uh, the more fulfilling it became. I decided it really wasn't about what I was doing. It was about how I was doing it and that I was doing it with others, with people. Yeah. It wasn't about the tasks. It wasn't about the money. I, I, I've been doing this for 10 years and I don't get paid for it for the most part. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I just, I'm just here to help. And the more I try and help, the more it helps me. Mm -hmm. But I do think you have to lean into this notion of figuring out what matters most to you. Most of us haven't done that. You know, you were at J and J I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get it wrong, but I think 19 years or something around there. I was in the industry, the pharma industry, 19 years. I was at J and J. Probably. 19 years. Yeah. That eight. And, and I was in the in the food industry forever. And it took me a long time to, to real. I hadn't really thought about what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. I was li literally living life by the seat of my pants and just reacting to what was coming and trying to do the best I could. Right. Well, this is my, you know, when I coach people now, I say, this is your one life. I think you need to do a little. You can do better than just doing it by the seat of your pants. Right. You have to think about what matters most to you and spend time with that. And I wrote a whole book on that called The Blueprint. But and then you have to be intentional, figure out what matters most. And there's a process for doing it. A lot of people have written about it. Mm -hmm. And then be intentional. Start doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us are mostly scripted by the demands from work and the demands from home and the demands yes. when mom calls and says, I need help. Can you come over? Uh, we're, we try and react and be helpful, give us that much credit, Yeah, but that's not good enough. We have to be more intentional now. We have to think about what matters most. Then we have to have enough personal discipline to put one foot in front of the other and move in that direction. I, the last thing I'll s say on this and, uh, we cover a lot more, but is the people I coach sort of want to have this happen now. And it's the same conversation I just we just talked about Stephen Covey. Can't talk the way out of something you behaved your way in, into. You've sort of behaved your way into a situation that's not fulfilling. Right. It's not like you're going to snap your fingers and it's all going to be better. Right. You sort of have to behave your way out of it with intention, putting one foot in front of the other. Because we live cockamamie lives. We do. You know? It's impossible to make some big change given all the connections we have and the demands on our lives. So we've got to have a change process which nests perfectly in our cockamamie life, yeah. which means yeah. they're small changes. James Clear wrote a great book on this, Atomic Habits. Yes. Uh, it's all about how the small things make profound differences. Yes. I wrote a book on it too. It's a bit called Touch Points. These small things in the fullness of time if done intentionally, can lead to a higher level of fulfillment. 
So now a lot of people believe that they go to work, they do a job, and then they have their personal life or their personal passions or their story of which makes up who they are. And that's very separate. You shared with me a quote that is very dear to you by someone that we mutually adore. And that's Brene Brown. And you quote her uh, one quote here. It says, you walk, you can walk inside your own story and own it or stand outside of your story and hustle for your worthiness. Talk to us about this quote and the idea of owning your story. It's funny. I did not know the quote originally, but I had written the book about uh, that the, that we wrote called The Blueprint. One of the lines that comes screaming out of that book is your life story is your leadership story. Mm-hmm. And as I was doing talks on it, I stumbled on Brene's quote and uh, I started using it. And every year I pick one quote that I like to use in a lot of venues. And I had picked that quote. And then six months later, I get this call about doing a podcast with her and we sort of connected on this quote and the quote, yeah, you can either walk inside your story and own it, or you can stand outside of your story and and hustle for your worthiness every day. The notion for me was I was an oldest and uh, I was walking inside my parents' story for me You know, it was being scripted. My grandparents, what they expected of me, Mm -hmm. then my teachers, my coaches, my professors at college, when I went to work, my bosses, they were writing the script for me. And as a oldest, I was trying to live into that script. And I realized after I was fired from a job that that really wasn't working too well. It was working well about half the time, but the other half of the time, it just wasn't speaking to me. Right. And so when I was fired and I had a chance to really do some self-examination with some outplacement help, I had this crusty old uh, uh, executive outplacement fellow uh, challenging me on, what's your story, Doug? I don't want to hear what their story is. You're telling me what your boss wants. What, you know, what's your story? What do you want? And uh, I'm slow. It took me a while. I was 34 at the time. And uh, I spent a year with him, and he was one of my dear friends until he passed away in 2006, 16 years ago. Uh, But uh, he said, what's your story? So I started to define what mattered most to me. And I found it took an intentional process, which he led me through, Mm -hmm. uh, to sort of get anchored in something like, what does matter most to me? And And ultimately, I created a purpose statement, which is part of the process in in the blueprint. And uh, having that intention influenced everything I did every day. Mm -hmm. I didn't have big dramatic changes, but if I was going to honor people, if I was going to inspire trust and clarify this higher ambition I had in life, I needed to show up a certain way every day. Right. And it started to shape the way I behaved and it reflected my story that I aspired to write. And my other friend, Bill George, has a quote. He says, before you can change the world, you have to change yourself. Yes. I don't necessarily, I, I wouldn't say it that way, but I would say before you can change your world, you have to become the best version of yourself. Right. And at that point in time when I was fired, which was devastating, I started a journey trying to become the best version of myself. And 37 years later, I'm still working it. So, uh, but that, that's what that quote means to me. And Brene, mm-hmm. uh, she, she's incredibly gifted. And uh, we're very aligned on this need to walk inside our story and own it. And to have courage as we walk in that story. But to have the courage of your convictions as you go to work or with your family, you have to know what your convictions are. And you can't do that by the seat of your pants. It's not good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I started to say Warren Bennis earlier, he he called it a VUCA world, Mm -hmm. V-U-C-A. This was in 1987. Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And that was in 1987. Today, the world would be a VUCA world on steroids, right? 
Seriously. Incredibly volatile, incredibly uncertain, oh, yeah. increasingly complex, and at the same time, very ambiguous. And we're trying to navigate that world with intention. And so all right, we got to be pretty well, uh, we got to have our rudder in the water. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to have the courage of our convictions and we're not going to be able to become the best version of ourselves. Right. So to have the courage of your convictions, you need to be intentional. You need to think about what matters most. So, so Piece I have to, cake. Piece I, of cake. I have to ask because, like, I'm a fan. So tell me, what was it like meeting Brene? Uh, it was incredibly natural. I uh, look. I've I met a lot of people. Uh, a lot of amazing people, and uh, uh, and Brene, uh, what I what I liked about her was it was natural and it was authentic and it wasn't a game. Nice. Uh, so if there was, and you know, I'm not, you know, I've, I've met her once. Uh, we've gotten to know each other in other ways, but uh, she uh, she is a real gift to this world. And I felt fortunate to spend a little time with her. But what I like about her is she's natural. She's curious. Uh, uh, somebody used to talk about character and they defined it as uh, what you see is what you get. And with Brene, you sort of feel that way. It's this mm -hmm. Texas, what you see is what you get kind of person. Yeah. And uh, I think obviously a lot of people are drawn to that. Yeah, I admire her. I love her work. I mm -hmm. I truly adore what she has to say. And a matter of fact, I remember when I was when I was invited to give my TED talk, I went and watched her TED talk. And I was so moved by her TED talk that I reached out to her assistant to tell her assistant to tell her that I was inspired by her TED talk and I was going to do my best to make my talk my talk amazing. Well, uh, she's a great role model. She yeah. certainly is. And, uh, and she, I don't know, how do you define oh. a great role model? Well, it's someone who agrees with you usually. So, yeah. uh, because she and I agree, I think she's great. <laughs> so, uh, I, I don't, I don't know if that's the best reason, but that's the reality of it. Yeah. I am. I, I I'm a big fan. You know what I want to know if it just popped in my head, um, like, I have a couple of questions. So when you, how old were you? So Leanne asked the question, how old were you when you were working with Campbell to make that major shift? I became CEO of Campbell when I was 49. Wow. And uh, I had done everything but be a CEO and I thought I was ready for it. But until you sit in the chair of a, of a job, you're not really ready. And uh, so I, it, it was, it was a, it was a huge, huge challenge. But I must say, I've been working on this intentional leadership path mm -hmm. that ultimately culminated in the Blueprint book mm -hmm. for many years. I had a, my rudder was in the water. I knew what mattered most. Right. I knew what we needed to do, and I was determined to do it. And I knew we weren't going to be able to talk our way out of it. We had to behave our way out of it over time. Uh, so at, at from 30,000 feet, I had a good blueprint for what was required to get that turnaround. That having been said, we were talking about people's lives. Yes, yes. And, and, and people, and uh, it was... Uh, it, it, it was incredibly hard. So I was 49. And Leanne, you noted that one of three of my senior leaders uh, go from one in three to one. In, you got it right, actually. It was unbelievable. Uh, there were so many executives. We're talking top of the house. We were, Campbell Soup Company uh, had 20, roughly 25,000 people. We were in uh, 38 countries, mm -hmm. and it was, were much more than soup. Here in the United States, you would know Pepperidge Farm. Mm -hmm. You would know uh, V8 juice, Campbell mm -hmm. tomato juice, a yep. host of things, Swanson broths, oh, uh, lots lots of products. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and to have 
a hundred of your top leaders not showing up yeah. was uh, scary, you know, yeah. because as a leader, you also know that it all depends on them because you're, you know, 99 out of a hundred decisions every day are made when you're not in the room. Yeah. And you may be the CEO, but you're not in the room. And yeah. by the time you hear about the decision that was made, it's going to have been reimagined and recast so it makes perfect sense, even if it was a bad decision. By the time somebody tells it to you, let me tell you, here was the situation. This We had no choice. We had to do this. Yeah. Uh, so you're totally dependent on others. Yeah. And uh, I knew that coming in, but I felt it as a CEO. So I quickly realized we had to get a leadership team, the top 350, that were all singing from the same song sheet yeah. and had a common set of values. And uh, that took us three years. We In the first three years, we went be, from becoming uh, the worst company in, in, in the global food industry of the top 20 to being competitive. It took three years to just get competitive. Wow. And, uh, and just put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. Uh, and during those three years, we turned over 300 of our top 350 leaders. Wow. Now, I mean, incredibly hard. Sure. Uh, no, nobody wanted to do it, but a hundred of those didn't want to be there anyway. Sure. And sure. they were leaving anyhow. And then uh, we made it clear that if you wanted to stay here for the first three years, you had to truly evidence this commitment to serving all of our employees and our customers and our our world with distinction. Right. And so if, if you weren't in year one, we talked about it. Year two, we said we're going to start uh, measuring how we evaluate you on it. By year three, we're going to get really in your business if you haven't made the switch. Right. And so by year three, we turned over 300 of the top 350. Of the 300 we turned over, we were able to promote 150 people inside who were just dying to be part of the new leadership team. But we ended up hiring 150 blue chip senior leaders from outside. In my corporate experience, I don't know of another Fortune 500 company that's turned over 300 of the top 350 leaders. It was a uh, scary situation for a first time CEO. But I didn't. Kudos. I, wow. I didn't know what else to do. We had to have the right people well, uh, on the bus. That leads me to my next question, though, because you seem like you always knew who to listen to. You're dropping these names like, you know, when I met Stephen Covey. Talk to us about who your mentors were, who your leaders were that you learned from, that you gleaned these insights so that you had been ready for this opportunity. Well, I will. And uh, if you. If anybody looks at our book or my book, or I, I'm sure I've got it on my website somewhere. Okay. I have this concept of the entourage of excellence. And it's, it's who are the people that influence you? Right. And, uh, and we encourage people to reflect on that, people in their lives, people in their work life, and people from history who really influence you. Right. And create this tapestry. Literally have their pictures up. And... Uh, create this tapestry of these people that had a profound influence on you and use it as allow it to influence you as you become, try and become the best version of yourself. Uh, in my tapestry, I have my mother who was one tough nut, but I also have Stephen Covey. I have my outplacement counselor that helped me find my way uh, uh, and find my story, yeah. Neil McKenna in Boston. I have Warren Bennis, who I became friends with and uh, who was teaching out in Santa Barbara. He wrote it, many leadership books. And yeah. if there was a uh, if, if there was a Mount Rushmore for thought leaders in the United States for the 20th century, I would have Warren up there. And uh, he wrote the among other, the book that caught my eye was uh, and led me to get to know him was uh, uh, leading people's like herding cats. And uh, uh, and I felt that way. I felt like I was hurting a lot of cats. And uh, so I dialed into him and uh, he he was enormously helpful to me. Uh, 
I'm, I could go on and on. My tapestry, Meta Norgard, who I've written with, who I teach with to this day, mm -hmm. ran the Executive Conference Center uh, for Stephen Covey. Uh, and she's from uh, Denmark. And she's been a big influence on, on my life. My wife is at the center of my tapestry. Uh, you know, if, if, if I think we should turn right, she thinks we should turn left. Uh, and uh, it's great. Uh, she stretches me all kinds of ways. So I have a lot of influences and I look to the world around me and I, I'm always looking and who is somebody is, you know, is somebody doing something that speaks to me and maybe I could incorporate that into my life right. or are they doing something that I never want to do? Yeah. Am I, is there a lesson there? In fact, you learn more from what you don't want to do than oh. what you do want to do. So I encourage people to look at the world around you, yeah. uh, the people closest to you, and then let it grow out and see what resonates with you and draw conclusions from it and let it influence how you choose to walk in the world. We found we had to create a process for doing that, which is what the blueprint's all about, but, uh, and never stop looking. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's another woman who I don't know, but I feel like I know her. Uh, I've never met her. And uh, she, she's written all this, she's done all this work on the growth mindset, a professor at Stanford. And she basically says, if you think you can grow, you will. Yeah. And so I encourage people to have this growth mindset yeah. and always be looking for opportunities. I'm learning from you right now as we talk. And I'll take that with me and say, what did I draw from this conversation? that will help me do a little better tomorrow than I did today mm -hmm. in a manageable way. Uh, and uh, it makes life much more interesting every day. Yep. And, and as life gets more interesting, I find it gets more fulfilling. Awesome. I love it. I love it. So we're going to turn over uh, to, I'm going to point people. I want people to check out your, your website. Uh, we have it on the ticker. Uh, leadership.com I believe it is. Yeah. yeah. I want them to check out your website. I did when I posted the PR materials for this interview, Doug, I posted the link to your blog entry that I want to, I want to talk about your recent, I don't know how recent, maybe you got something after that, but you posted a very powerful, vulnerable and authentic uh, message. It was all about your COVID rut. And as a leader leading other people, you found yourself in a COVID rut, which I know so many people could relate to. Um, talk to us about that. Share a little bit about that with us. Well, and sort of well I was, uh, you know, it was it's, obviously we all have our COVID stories, don't we? Yeah. And uh, and as a parent and as a influencer in the leadership discussion, a coach a mentor. Uh, I, I felt like if anybody should be prepared to go through this, it should be me. But, you know, uh, right, right before COVID really reared its ugly head, my mother passed away. And then during COVID, my father passed away. They both passed away from old age, but I was unable to really celebrate their lives. And I was un unable because of COVID to be with my father when he passed. And uh, so I was reflecting and I'm the oldest. And now I really feel the pressure because, well, they're gone. And guess who's the executor of, of their estates is and mm -hmm. and all this. So I had that. I had the Conant Leadership Organization that I care deeply about. I wanted all them to be able to get through this and prosper. Uh, I have our three three children, all of whom had their own things to deal with. I was still coaching and mentoring. And I kept trying to show up for everybody. And one of the things I talk about often is you can't pour from an empty cup. You have to take care of yourself. First and foremost, you have to take care of yourself. You think about when you're flying on an airline and they're giving your instruction on if the mask drops down. You first have to put it on your child and take care of them before. I mean, you have to put yours on first to take care of yourself and then attend to yeah. your child. Yeah. It's sort of the same thing. You have to fill your own cup. You can't count on other people to fill it. So I, I thought, you know what? I'm pouring from an empty cup. This is exhausting. I can't keep doing this. 
uh, and I'm doing it on Zoom and ugh, uh, I'm not able to really truly be there for people and show the kind of empathy that I'm feeling. So I'm trying to even be more empathetic uh, on Zoom. Yeah. It, it, I, I was just wearing myself out and I, I started thinking, well, what's what's going on here? And then I went back and I started thinking, well, why am I doing this? I don't have to do any of this, you know, other than be with my family. I don't, most of what I do, I don't have to do. I, I'm choosing to do it. So why am I doing it? And I stumbled upon, I went back to my purpose, which I've written down. And I, uh, <laughs> I, I said, well, this is good, but what's missing for me? And I came up with three words that really spoke to me, joy, fulfillment, and impact. It was, it was no longer joyful. It was increasingly less fulfilling. And I didn't feel like I was having the impact I had. And I, I started to roll around in that. As I got into it, I realized I was actually jump-starting the blueprint process that I wrote a whole book about. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it in terms of me. I wrote that for everybody else. But lo and behold, I was reevaluating my purpose. I was looking at the world around me. Step two is you reflect on your life story. Step mm -hmm. three is you study the world around you. Step four is, okay, you got all that data now. Build a plan that you can actually do. And then step five is develop some practices that bring that pen to life in a tangible way. So I literally took myself through the same process and uh, started looking for practices, small things I could do that could increase my joy quotient. And as my joy quotient was increasing, I found it more fulfilling. And I started to feel like I was starting to have impact again. I had a little spring in my step. It wasn't overnight, but uh, as I was going through this, I felt, uh, or I was talking with our staff and they said, you ought to share this. And I said, but that's about me. I don't want to talk about me. I'm trying to help everybody else. And they said, it'll help everybody else if you share if you're if you dare to be vulnerable, Brene would have been proud of me. I haven't talked to her since I wrote that, and uh, and uh, and it was right. They were right. I ended up writing about it, and then I ended up living into it because once you write about it and you declare this to the world, you feel like God. I really have to show up this way now. So it actually was a good impetus to get me to the next level of my pursuit of joy, fulfillment, and impact. So this was your revised. Oh, there you go. Leadership. Yeah, I engineered it in. I intend to help leaders. Neil McKenna gave me the word help. Uh, he was the guy. Every time I called him, he was my outplacement counselor. Every time I called him, he would answer the phone before cell phones and caller ID. I'm old. Uh, he would say, how can I help? He didn't even know who was on the other end of the phone. He'd say, how can I help? So he was just there to help. I love that mindset. So I engineered that and I built in the world intentional, but then I engineered leaders that I, this was my purpose, experience joy, fulfillment and impact. I've always been talking about trust and performance, yep. honoring people, which we talked about earlier, growth mindset, which we talked about earlier. And look, this is not about other people and how they critique me. My favorite quote is a Teddy Roosevelt quote, which is about defying the critics. Yes. And uh, the credit belongs to the person who's actually in the arena. In the arena. Face is marred with dust and sweat and blood. Yes. That's where I want to be. I want to be in the arena. Yes. And I want to be in, in, in it in a way where I can thrive in the face of the adversity I, I feel. So okay. I ended up, that's my new statement, and I'm sticking to it. It speaks to me, and it leads to... Uh, it influences my behavior every day. I love it. I love it. Thanks for sharing that. I was I was uh, hoping you would be willing to share that because I think it's important. People need to give themselves grace. This is something I'm always trying to highlight. Listen, we just went through a pandemic. Give yourself grace. It's a journey. Um, mm. So that leads me to my next question, which is really around something that I am challenged by. Uh, in the work that I do. As you know, mental and emotional well-being, it's like on the forefront coming out of COVID. So many people have experienced in imbalances in their, in their mental health. And I'm the person that believes that you can preserve emotional well-being of your people and the mental health of people and still drive for results. But 
I want your perspective as a, as a leader. Do you think it is possible to lead? Look, uh, it's part of honoring people. Yes. Um, you just don't, don't honor part of a person. You have to honor the whole person. Right. Uh, and look, I'm going to way oversimplify this. I have a friend that another friend who passed away, wrote the book on this subject. It's called The Power Principle. Mm. His name was Blaine Lee. And uh, it's worth actually people who are interested in doing their homework on this. He, in the final analysis, he said there are three ways to influence people. One is you can, if you're the boss, you can tell them what to do and they'll do it. And you influence them basically by fear. The other, the next, that doesn't work very often. And as soon as you leave the room, you've built a reservoir or a ill will that will ultimately be your undoing. We know that as parents and as children. Yep. The, the next, the, the second alternative is to have transactional relationships, which are, if you do this, I'll do that. And, you know, they work. Yeah. Most of corporate America is built on a transactional model, sure. which will pay for performance. Yes. Okay. You do this, I'll pay you this much. Uh, you know, you transactional. And then you, then you, then he would challenge people to close their eyes and think about the person who had the most profound influence on them in their life. And he would say, how often do they use fear to motivate and influence you? The answer is never, pretty much. How, what was the basis of their power that they were exceptionally good at being transactional with you? No, it had nothing to do with it. They weren't saying, if you're good, I'll give you a quarter. That was not what was motivating me. And then he went to the third leg of the stool and he said, you know what they did? His word, they honored you. They honored where you were as a person, a whole person. Yeah. And guess what? You started to honor them. Yes. And you held them in increasingly high regard. They right. honored you, you honored them. Right. That had a profound influence on me. And that's what I believe about all of this disability space. We all have disabilities. Yes. We all do. And we have to honor each other, all of each other, yep. every person. Yep. And, and uh, we have to be sensitive to it. You can't sustain uh, high performance relationships when you're just honoring part of a person. It, it's and This is just my opinion. Yeah. But I don't believe it's sustainable. So it's hard. It's hard. But leadership is hard. If you want to be a leader, it's not like, I mean, I think you have to work at it. I view leadership as a craft. I think you apprentice at it, you study it, you work hard at it, and then you get better. Uh, but this, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. You have people's livelihoods and lives in your hands. Yeah. You know, you most do. people, you know, the people that I work with, most of them were thinking more about work than anything they did, including being home. You know, they work all day, go home for dinner, have dinner with the family, uh, or walk their dog if they didn't have a family, and then go back, you get on email, do some more work, go to bed thinking about what they have to do tomorrow, wake up thinking about what they have to do, check in their email, go into work and doing it all over again. Right. Uh, you have to honor all of the person, not just the work person. I appreciate that. Um, I think that's so important. Um, so linking, thinking about leading in the new, in the new world, right? We mentioned this before you mentioned it. You said, wow, this is, could this be any more complex for leadership right now in, in a post COVID world? What are, uh, for the leaders out there and for people who are just trying to, um, look at themselves and say, what is it that I can do to become a stronger leader, be more, uh, successful or be a better, uh, you know, human being, what kind of, what particular qualities would you say we need to be thinking about in order to succeed in this new world? Well, you know, I think, uh, and I'll offer some of this. When I wrote the book, The Blueprint, I have a list of 10 things that I think are really important for leaders today. But I realized they didn't matter as much and uh, as a leader figuring out what mattered most to them. Mm. So we spent the first half of the book uh, helping them figure out, well, what matters to you, Michelle? What matters to you, Doug? What's important? Yeah. How do you want to show up? What's the best version of yourself? So the first thing I would say is 
you need to do that work first. You need to be walking inside your story before you start looking out and grabbing on to pieces oh, from outside. Right. So the first thing is walk inside your story and do the work. Uh, when I inter when I would interview people, I found there were three key characteristics that ultimately were important. And I've interviewed a lot of people. Uh, and this is not even 30,000. This is 100,000 feet. Okay. Uh, they had to be competent at what they were being asked to do. Right. They had to be, so they had to know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. They had to have good character. They had to do what they said they were going to do. And the third one was there had to be good chemistry. And uh, I ended up using three C's, but, and there's a fourth in a minute, but uh, that the notion of chemistry is when you're in the work world, you've got to work with others. You're not working by yourself. And so there has to be good chemistry. You have to be able to work with a group of people and the chemistry has to be good. So I, I would say, know what you're doing, do what you say you're going to do and do it well with others. Uh, those are the, the three key ones. Uh, the, in the U.S. Army, totally separate, the Army Field Manual said the title of it uh, or the collection of words they used at one time were three things, be, know, do. Be a person of good character, know what you're doing and do it well with others. Uh, that's the essence of this. And then you have to have courage. That's probably the fourth C. And as I said earlier, it's hard to have the courage of your convictions if you don't know what your convictions are. Yeah. So you have to do the work to yeah. figure out what matters most to you yeah. and then layer in those other things. Yes, I love uh, that. And if I had to give you, uh, and for me, when I did that work, I ended up saying, I've got to honor people. Yeah. I've got to inspire trust. Mm -hmm. And I have to tether everything I do to something that's larger than myself, uh, a higher purpose. And uh, so that's a lot of words, but yeah. those are the things that speak to me when I think about growing as a leader. I love that. It's so good. Uh, it all comes back to self-awareness, you know, being being really aware of, of what what it is that you value. And I think um, not being afraid of looking in the mirror and doing the work. Right. I think that's the key message. Yeah, here. And examining your life story. I mean, I know enough about your life story to know it, it influenced where you are today. Totally. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to go back and do that. Uh, but you sort of have to. And as you do that kind of work, you find your path. You and if you don't, you're at risk. You're, no. you're just at risk. So this notion, Brene Brown quote, of walking inside your own story is, I mean, it's essential. Yes. It's everything. I, I think I can share with people that there's this deep peace within me knowing the work that I'm doing every day is truly aligned with my heart and, and what I care about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as successful as I was in my pharmaceutical career um, and the people I loved working with, there was never that peace, that calm, that serenity about I'm doing work that's on, that is completely aligned with, with what I know um, mm -hmm. my values to be. So. And, and I sort of feel the same way and this, but you got to work through it. You mm -hmm. know, you worked in pharma for 19 years yeah. and sort of ended up here, Yeah. you know, and I, I feel fortunately I plan to live to 120. So I have 49 years left, but mm -hmm. I feel like I'm starting to hit my stride at the age of 71. You know, yeah. this, this is something you sort of, Hopefully you grow into with time and, and, and intention. And uh, anyway, that's my story. I'm I still love it. So, <laughs> so how do we follow you and continue to learn from you and what's next for you? We want to, we want to make sure people know how to, how to connect with you. Well, uh, and we'd love, you know, we have a conversation going with 400,000 people every day uh, across our social media platform. And we're, if you want to be part of a, of this leadership conversation, the kind of language that you've heard today, you can find find me at conantleadership.com. But we're also very active on LinkedIn. 
and uh, and Twitter. I'm frustrated by Twitter, but I feel a need to be there because we want to have this message yes. as part of the Twitter universe, not outside of it. We're also on Instagram, Facebook. You can track us all down at, at Doug Conant. Awesome. And uh, we welcome people to contribute to the conversation. We're learning and growing every day and, and uh, helping each other, you know, lifting each other up. And it's a beautiful thing. Even in the face of all this difficulty, yeah. uh, there are just some amazing people out there helping each other do a little better every day. And, and uh, those are the people we're talking to. And we're trying to give them the energy to fight the good fight and to fill their cup up and to go help others. So that's, that's our story. Love it. Thank you so much, Doug. It's been truly a pleasure and an honor to get to have you here with us today. Thank you for your wisdom and everything. And I look forward to staying connected to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I wish you and all your viewers the best. Thank you, Doug. Have a great one. You too. Bye-bye.